Hey guys, do you know someone considering renting their property as an Airbnb? I have worked with Rental Advisor for over a decade, and Rental Advisor provides free rental projections to prospective owners, realtors, and investors for any property in the US. So if you know someone considering getting into the vacation rental industry, have them email management at myrentaladvisor.com to get their free revenue projections. Anyway, um, well, cool, man. Um, thanks for coming on. And, you know, just to jump into it, the first thing I, I want to do is just kind of tell everybody a little bit about what brought this whole thing together and, and your background and, and how this all came about to you writing this book. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been writing kind of online about Mormonism about being a Latter-day Saint um, as long as I've been online pretty much. So if you want to talk about like why I talk about this stuff at all, I mean, it goes to way back before my mission um, when it was just kind of something that I did, and, you know, that was before social media really took off. So it was like various just chat rooms and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of innocently would sometimes use Mormon in my nickname, like the Storm and Mormon was my gaming handle a lot. Um, <laughs> the first couple of times I did that, I took so much heat from people who didn't like the church. And I was like, well, now I'm never changing it. Like now we're, now it's go time. So for a long time, you know, I don't, obviously we don't use Mormon so much anymore, but for a long time I would just kind of go places and that would be my nickname. And then people would start fights with me and I don't know. I didn't really know fight, but I, I just kind of, you know, it, 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 what happened in a lot of places is somebody I had no idea, like people that I, these are anonymous people mostly, right? So it's uh -huh. just folks, I have no idea who they are, but I'd get messages all the time. Like they'd be like, Hey, I'm also LDS, but I'm afraid to like stand up for our beliefs. Just want to let you know that like, I really appreciate it. And so I kind of had this idea that I was a little bit of a lightning rod for other people. Well, we'd lost connection and, and you were talking about that, you know, you're involved in these online discussions. Latter-day Saint members kind of see you speaking up about the church and speak out. And is that, that's, so that's kind of how you got involved in, in, in online writing. Yeah. I get, off my, I get home from my mission. I start doing some blogging. I get invited to write for times and seasons. And my first season, uh, first series that I wrote for them was on um, intellectual humility or epistemic humility is like the fancier term for it. Um, and that was really kind of the genesis of this book. A lot of the things that made it into this book are, are things that I started writing back then when I was just thinking about, um, you know, the intersection of faith and reason, um, what it means to really believe when we talk about faith, what do we really mean? Um, but the fundamental question that really turned all of it into a book was just looking at the world around us and asking, why is it, why does it feel hard to believe? Why is it difficult? And that was, that's really the driving question of this book is, is what is it about life or about our modern times, about the secular age, whatever you want to call it, what is it that makes belief difficult? Absolutely. That's great. Well, it's funny. That's, I, I think you and I have a, a, a big similarity in that I, I did a video series on kind of my faith crisis journey. It wasn't a faith crisis. I call it kind of a faith remodeling, but it started at that same level where I started asking questions about epistemology, about like, how do I know what I know? Right. And that's really like the foundation of the very beginning of the whole quest. Right. And so I, I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, I read it and it's real short. Just everyone knows um, you can get it on audible. Like I did, although I did also get a physical copy. So um, I, a lot of times do that. Um, but yeah, get it on audible, everybody. It's, it's only a few hours and it's worth every second and what it deals with. Another thing my audience kind of hear a lot from me, I talk about sort of a level one, level two and level three conversation right? I talk about, you can have conversations about, you know, the most fundamental things. That's level one. That's where you're talking about, like, what am I? Like, what is reality? You know, how do we know what we know? You know, these sorts of questions. And, and that, I think, when you look at the world and everything, it leads you to a belief in God, right? And then once you have a belief in some sort of a higher power or God, that leads you to level two, where you're kind of searching for God, like what is this higher power? And that's where I believe you come to Jesus Christ is the answer, at least I have. And then that only at that point, once you've completed kind of conversation one and conversation two, are you ready to move into level three where you're talking about the restoration and, and theology and the doctrines of the church compared to other Christian denominations and all that kind of stuff. And so your book, what I loved about it, and I want to kind of, for my audience, 
it's a great book to put into your level one quiver of basic conversations um, about these sort of things. So if someone was to come to you and just say, hey, oh, you wrote a book, what's it about? How would you summarize the book? I mean, if I'm doing a really short summary, it's just this is, uh, it's it's a doubt your doubts book. That's really what it's about. That's kind of the approach. It's, it's you know, taking that phrase from, from um, President or Elder Dorf and just filling that in with all the science and kind of the, the, the almost the secular reasoning behind it. I mean, that's one of the things that's, that's distinctive about the book, right? We're writing about faith from a faithful perspective, but almost everybody that we cite and that we quote in the book is actually in the social sciences or, or biological sciences. And they're all in, you know, coming from secular perspectives. Um, so it's really just saying, you know, bring us like the, the toughest questions that you've got and on all the analysis and the critiques that you want. And let's take it seriously and let's look through it. And at the end of the day, we're going to say that there's just as much reason to doubt your doubts here as, as people would have, have you believe there is to doubt your faith. And um, that's what it is in a nutshell. And we just go through the tour of like, if we're going to talk about why is faith difficult, we need to understand how and why we come to believe things. And so that's why, you know, we've got it divided into the three sections, the rationalism, the scientism, and then on faith, we want to understand first where beliefs come from at an individual level. And that's where we talk about rationalism as well as at like at a collective and a social level. That's where we talk about scientism. And once we have that context for like why people form beliefs, how people form beliefs, then we can really put the pieces together and have a conversation with, okay, now that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about belief formation let's talk about faith let's talk about belief in god why is that difficult and and, and why should it be difficult honestly in some ways like a, a lot of the parts of the plan of salvation are difficult by design um and that's that's the case with faith as well yeah no that's fantastic and that was kind of as i analyze the book and kind of what what is it it's very much what you had said it's this dialogue about you know where where do people mostly get their beliefs? Well, they get them from rationalism and from scientism. Those are kind of the two areas that in the modern culture are like the holy grail of knowledge. And that's kind of the only thing. But people have never looked into the critiques of a hard rationalist or a hard scientistic sort of worldview. And your book explores that. Um, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is a lot of people have looked into the critiques, but not from a religious perspective. Like mm -hmm. one of the people we cite the most is Jonathan Haidt, right? Very famous, very well known, very influential. And he is one of the people leading the critique of, of rationalism. Now, this is not a critique of reason, like that, that we shouldn't believe in logic or that we shouldn't believe in evidence or anything like that. Just as like it's also not a critique of science. Rationalism is the idea that not only should you believe in reason, but reason is all there is. It's all there should be. You don't need anything but pure logic that's where you've taken reason too far. Um, and there are really solid critiques of that from Jonathan Haidt, from Franz de Waal. There's a lot of people making these critiques. It's just religious people don't always hear them because these critiques are coming you know, from one secular perspective against another. And so we're just taking those critiques and saying, hey, this is relevant for people of faith, not just Latter-day Saints, but Christians and even Muslims, Jews, all people of faith. These critiques are relevant and you should be aware of them. And yeah. Trying, and they're not coming from just like a religious Bible thumper. It's yeah, like, no, not at all. And, and that's that's the other thing is you read the book. This isn't like a bunch of quotes from general authorities. These are like, uh, you know, kind of the secular take on the critique of of hard rationalism, um, which I might call it. So I, I recently released a series of videos on what I call my collective witness model of these different kind of ways that we come about knowing things. And and one of them, one of the critiques that I make is you can't rely on any one of them alone because it limits your view, right? If you crown reason as king and it's the trump card to all else and it's kind of like that's the only valid way of knowing, you end up actually limiting what you can see. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And 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 Jonathan uh Haidt who you who you quote in the book and go through extensively, you talk about his elephant and the rider analogy. I discovered this quite a while back because I read his book, uh, The Righteous Mind, it's an absolutely brilliant analogy. Go ahead and kind of lay out the rider and the elephant analogy. Yeah. Um, so this is, th that analogy comes from Jonathan Haidt, but I just want to point out that he's talking about the same kind of um, division of people between two pieces that a lot of other social psychologists are also coming to. So everybody has their own name and I like his the best. Um, so for him, the rider is the rational mind. It's the part of you that, that thinks using words. 
um, and that makes conscious effort. And a lot of the times when people think of themselves, they think just of the writer because that's the part that's obvious to yourself. It's the part that has the internal monologue. So that's the writer. The elephant is kind of the unconscious, but not really in a Freudian sense. It's more in like a, a deeper, like, um, you know, we've, we are evolved creatures um, in this, in this paradigm. And so we have all these systems that are working constantly, um, like vision, for example, um, vision is a very complicated system. It's not consciously controlled. It happens all the time. Um, and so anything that you're doing, that's kind of unconscious. Another thing is like status seeking. We're always constantly aware of kind of what our social status is. And we always want more status. That's the elephant. That, that's making those calculations. Um, and the reason we, uh, the reason Jonathan Haidt picked the elephant and the writer is it's, the elephant is really in charge in a lot of ways. It's very, very powerful um, because it is always operating. It's like, it's like aut uh, automatic processes. The writer is deliberate effort. So anytime the writer wants to do something, um, it, it takes your willpower and it can really only do one thing at a time. And so what you have is a bunch of people who think that they're in control of themselves. They think that they're making their decisions for rational reasons. They think the writer is in charge. They're all blind to the fact that they're sitting on top of a big giant elephant. And if you don't know the big giant elephant is there, you're never really going to be in charge of your own life. If you know that it's there, then you can work with the elephant. You can train the elephant. Um, and you can kind of take control of, of, of what you believe and, and of what you're doing. But as long as you're ignorant to the elephant, you're just on a ride that, that you're not in control of. Let me bring up a, a quote from the book uh, that, that talks about this. Um, you were talking about, um, th this is sort of the idea of the, the divided self. Um, and the idea that there's kind of this divide within us between this writer, the rational part of us, and then the elephant, which is the right, you know, if the elephant wants to go one way, it goes one way. And then the writer begins to kind of post hoc, make up reasons why, oh, I actually wanted to go this way. And here's all the reasons why, you know what I mean? And, but it's interesting what you say in the book about this. You say, now that we understand the nature of the divided self and the value of intuition, this is sort of the, the writer side of, or the, the elephant side of it, we're ready to return to the subject of faith and belief with two key observations that are hard to accept uh, without the divided self model. First, you don't always know what you believe. And second, you don't always know why you believe. That hit me. I was like, whoa. Because it's something that I've heard before, but you put it really well. I mean, people don't consider, what if you actually don't know what you really believe? Like, Yeah, I mean, and it's hard to convince people of that because they're so deep into, well, I know the writer and I am the writer, so I know myself. No, there's a whole elephant. And if you're not aware of that, then you don't know yourself. And you might think you believe something, but thinking you believe something and actually believing it are two different things. So that leads to the question, how do we determine what, like, okay, if, if we postulate the idea that we don't know what we believe, if our beliefs actually are rooted somewhere in the elephant and not rooted in the writer, then it's like, it, it's, it's weird. It, it, there's sort of this question where like, it isn't, you go, oh, I don't believe in God. It's like, really, do you? Like, what if you actually do believe in God deep down? Like, or... On the other hand, what if someone says, yeah, I believe in God? It's like, do you really? Like, I mean, that's the personal question for me. I've talked about this. Uh, I don't think I talked about it in the book, but I've talked about it when I talk about the book is I want to know if I really believe in all of it, in God and life after death and the whole thing, because I don't want to come to the end of my life whenever that is. And all of a sudden realize I'm actually not sure. And, and it, like the expression I, I use is I don't want to die afraid. Mm -hmm. that would just be like, it, it would, it would, it would be a repudiation of my whole life that I lived my whole life thinking I was one way, but I really wasn't. Um, and so how, like exactly what you're asking is how do you find out what you really believe? Um, and so what we talk about in the book is this idea of the theory of revealed belief. And the idea is that you can only know what a person believes, including yourself by looking at their actions. And it's not as simple as just actions speak louder than words. That's, that's kind of true, but it's, there's more to it than that. You have to look at those times when a person has to make a decision that's costly. So it's gonna cost them something. And where the only way that that decision makes sense, the only way you can say that's a good decision is if that belief is true. You see yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, it's like you know, paying your tithing is a really simple example. Um, you pay your tithing 
if God wasn't real, then why would you do it? Now, in this case, there are other reasons. You might just want to conform, you know, with, with the church. You might just be habit or whatever. But that's the kind of thing you have to look for in your own life. Am I making sacrifices that would be silly and irrational unless I really believe those things? And when you can see examples like that, then you can start to say, oh, this is what I actually believe. But it's, it's interesting because you, you kind of have to look at yourself the same way you look at other people. Um, not in the sense of judging, but just in the sense of trying to understand. You kind of have to look at yourself from the outside. Because when you look at yourself from the inside, it's just the writer talking to himself and, and none of that is, is reliable. Yeah, and that's it's funny. That's exactly, well, well, let me share a quote from the book first, from your book. And then I actually want to go to a scripture that I think illustrates this point, because this is not something that is outside of the scriptural canon as far as the idea. But first from your book, um, you, you say the only way to tell if one of our apparent beliefs is a real belief or a fictitious one is through the crucible of costly choices. Nassim Talib writes, there is a difference between beliefs that are decorative and those that map to action. Real belief is measured by skin in the game, he insists. How much can you how much you truly believe something can be manifest and manifested only through what you are willing to risk for it. Boom. That's good. And it's funny, I would say not only what you're willing to risk for it, but what you're willing to sacrifice for it. There's the there's the scripture in James. Let me pull this up and and share it here. Um it says, was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered his son, uh, offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect? It's the exact same idea. And I think this also helps resolve the whole, you know, faith versus works thing. It's like, it's not faith if it doesn't manifest in works. Like, we only find out what we really believe based on what we do, not what we say. I can say I believe whatever. It's kind of like I can say I love my wife, but do you really love her? Your actions are what are going to show that. But you, you're saying, so tell me more about this idea of it having to be costly. Like, like why does it have to be costly? Um, in economics, there's this concept of cheap talk. And it's this idea that when there isn't a cost, people can say whatever. Like if somebody's trying to sell you a car, they'll, they'll just say whatever. So actions that don't have a cost are really just a form of cheap talk. Even though you're not necessarily using your words, if it's just a signal, then you can't trust it. You can't trust it from yourself. You can't trust it from other people. Um, and you know, virtual virtue signaling is a term we hear a lot these days, and it refers to something real. And it's people who are making actions where the point of the action is just to kind of demonstrate that they're on the right team or that they have the right values. As long as those actions are cheap, it's you, you can't derive anything from it. When the actions are costly, that's when you can say, oh, the, there's something behind this. Like it's when you pay a price, that's when the action actually reflects something inside of you, as opposed to just being, you know, actions can be like clothes that you put on to fit in with the people around you. You know, you go to a protest because everybody else is going to protest. It sounds fun. You're going to go do it. And you want to like, you know, get that social status. That's not costly. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, if it's the protest where there's going to be people waiting for you with water cannons and get the dogs or something, well, okay, now it's costly. Like <laughs> now that means something. But it's That's... that cost that really separates just cheap talk, even with action from, from something that really means something to you. Well, and I think it isn't that interesting because that would also mean that if the plan of salvation is to prove us in some way, it's basically to manifest like, do we really love God? Do we really love one another? And that is manifest in what we're willing to sacrifice for that. And so it makes sense within the gospel context of this idea of you have to die. You have to, you know, it, you have to give yourself up entirely to Christ and his will and it's only in the doing of that that we that we are that we see what we really are. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it's a little bit of a different topic, but you go to the question of the problem of evil, like why do bad things happen to good people? And and my personal take on that is the world has to not make sense. The world has to be confusing. 
Because if we lived in a perfect world where every good action was immediately rewarded and every bad action was immediately punished, it would be impossible for people to cultivate virtue for the sake of virtue. Like if you lived in a world like that, how would you ever know if you cared about doing the right thing because it was the right thing versus if you cared about doing the right thing because you're immediately going to get rewarded for it. And I, like there would be no way to grow. There point. would be no way to be refined. And so it's the fact that sometimes you go out and you do the right thing and you don't get rewarded and you don't get thanked. And you look around you and some of the people who seem to be living the best lives, they probably aren't really, but they seem to be, they're getting rewarded. Some of them have done horrible, horrible things. Well, okay, because we've separated kind of cause and effect a little bit, there's, there's like a barrier there or there's a gap there. That's what lets you choose to do the right thing because it's the right thing. It's the ability to pay a price and to sacrifice to do the right thing that lets us cultivate the kind of virtue that I believe our heavenly parents want us to, to cultivate. Heavenly Father wants us to have the opportunity to be like him. We can't have that opportunity unless we have a chance to pay a price to do the right thing. Yeah, that's actually, that's, and if I'm understanding you right, it's like, I have to, I have to put my trust on it in him because if there's no trust involved, if it's just like immediately I get rewarded for everything that I do, it's just like cause and effect, right? It's just do this, get that. It's the need for that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to put my trust in you. And it's in, it's in the exercise of that trust that stepping out on the ledge that we learn and grow. Now, um, another thing that you had talked about in the book, and I have an exact quote for it, but you talked about things like the persecution of the early saints and even of Christianity in general, and how there's a difference between people who are Christians or Latter-day Saints versus those who are, I guess, sort of real, you know, Latter-day Saints and Christians to, to some extent, you know, maybe that's not the right words, but talk, talk a little bit to that. Yeah. So we use the term adherent versus convert. So an adherent is somebody who just puts on the label, whether it's Christian or Latter-day Saint, either it works in either case. Uh, and a convert is somebody who not only puts on the label, but there there's a real deep commitment there. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we talked about that is there's this kind of sense that, well, now in our secular age, belief is hard, but back in the day, belief was easy. And no, like we're, we're, we're questioning that. We're like, no, it's never been easy. It, it's hard in different ways now, but it's never yeah. been easy. And so we kind of traced like very, very briefly the history of Christianity. And we pointed out that like in the earliest days of the, of the very first saints, um, believing that a man rose from the dead is not something that like somebody 2000 years ago would have just taken on faith. Like we have this kind of really paternalistic or patronizing attitude towards people who lived before us as if they were all idiots. They weren't idiots. They were very, very familiar with death. They were more familiar with death than any modern American would be. So mm -hmm. first of all, they were asked to believe something that was hard for them to believe. It's not like it was just, oh yeah, sure. Guy rose, guy rose from the dead. Sounds good. Like I'm dumb and I believe in superstitious stuff. No, it was hard for them to believe. And secondly, they had to pay a really high price because Christianity taught, um, you know, doctrines that contradicted the, the society. There was the whole idea that, you know, you have to have self-control, you know, that um, chastity has been one of the defining attributes of Christianity throughout its entire existence, um, and then self-sacrifice. But also, it was very, very counterculture because it was teaching that all people are equal, which is exactly the opposite of what the Roman Empire would have taught, with this whole kind of hierarchy of, of patronage, where you have some people are more than others. So the point is that to be a Christian in the earliest days was to cut against the grain. And in that context, there's a very, very high cost associated with being Christian, so you're not going to get a lot of adherence. You're mostly going to get real converts because mm -hmm. the adherents aren't going to want to pay that cost. But then once Christianity became the official religion of, this, of the Roman Empire, um, then all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the incentives flip. Well, now you have two reasons to be a Christian, at least. One is that you really honestly believe you're a convert. And the other is, well, I want to get ahead in life. And this is the state religion. And so this will help me have more status. And so then you get a whole ton of adherence on, in addition to the converts. And so if you look at, you know, for the next thousand years or whatever, that's kind of the status. Everybody was Christian. Christian there were a ton of adherents, but you can't tell from the outside easily which ones are adherents and which ones are converts. So all this brings us to the present day where, you know, churches are declining in membership. There's this idea of the rise of the 
nuns, not nuns, Catholic nuns, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, <laughs> people who don't have any religious affiliation. And a lot of folks are like, oh, it's the end of religion, right? No, no, no. The incentives are just starting to revert. They're not nearly back to where they used to be when they fed Christians to the, to the lions in the Colosseum. We're not nearly there. But the benefits of adhering to Christianity are starting to diminish. And so the, the number of adherents are decreasing. But my, you know, me and my father's hypothesis in the book in, is that the number of converts probably isn't changing that much. There have never I, really been that many. It's been funny. It, well, it's sort of the wheat, wheat in the chaff sort of idea, sure. right? That when the winds blow, when the winds blow harder, that means what you're going to do is you're going to, you're basically going to get the, the adherents are going to blow away. And the people who really have put their faith in the Lord will, will remain. And th that's an interesting thing because you're exactly right. It used to be. The mainstream was to be a believer and to be a Christian. And now in our, just in, I feel like in my lifetime, in our lifetime, we're about the same age that it's flipped to where now it's like, if you're a believer and like a Christian, like it's kind of a edgy counterculture thing and you catch a lot of crap for it. And Latter-day Saints, I think traditionally, I think one of the reasons that I think we've had a higher percentage maybe of converts to adherence compared to some of the other major Christian sects is because there was a social cost to being a Latter-day Saint. And yeah, and we pay tithing and we have to do all this other stuff. So yeah, there were yeah. there have always been more costs. And it's kind of a bummer for the Latter-day Saints because we showed up to the party um, of, of finally being accepted as like kind of an American religion just at the time when all of a sudden nobody wanted to be at that party anymore. <laughs> so oops, too late for us. And, I, and you know, I don't want to overstate it because there is sometimes a persecution complex among um, Latter-day Saints and also just Christians in general. There is persecution of Christians in the world today. It's happening in other places, not in the United States. Um, like if you were to run as an atheist for president, that would be much worse than running as a Christian for president. But you're right, like things have changed. Like it used to be like all the incentives were in favor of Christianity and like we, we reached a peak and now it's starting to go down from there. Um, and also it just depends on like what context you're in. Like if if you're in like the rural South or something, being Latter-day Saint is not going to be good for you. But being a Christian will be still. If you're in, you know, New York City, eh, that's probably, and you, you know, if you're trying to make it in like mainstream media or something or, you know, get hired to the New York Times, no, like in those places, being devoutly religious and especially Christian is definitely going to be a, a, a negative. It's going to be a cost for you. Yeah. Well, let's let's switch gears a little bit here um, because we, we talked a little bit about rationalism and and how rationalism, if you're a hard rationalist, it's kind of like you're sort of ignoring the elephant, <laughs> the, the elephant in the... Or in the you're room, trying to right? suppress the elephant is the other thing. Sometimes rationalists are like, I admit there's an elephant, but I'm going to kill it and it'll be just the writer. And it's like, no, 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 no. The elephant is the source of your moral intuition. The elephant is the source of a lot that's good in you. You don't want to kill the elephant. You just want to recognize it and work with it. Yep. Yep. Very good. And... So let's talk a little bit about science. So I'm going to pull up a quote here from the book and, and I'll let you kind of speak to it. So um, let me add this in. Oh, this is the wrong one. Here it is. The debates about science versus religion are misleading because they treat the two approaches as contradictory when in reality they spring from a common trunk. What do you mean by that? So right now today, if you look at disciplines in academia, they're very, very, very specialized. So there's not just scientists, there's physicists versus chemists. And even within physicists, you could be an astrophysicist or a, you know, fluid dynamics physicist. So they're, they're very, very specialized, but you can kind of trace those different sciences to a common you know, root. Um, chemistry, physics, they would have been the natural sciences and then the social sciences. And what I'm saying is that if you look at this kind of going back towards, you know, from the, the edges where everything is very specialized towards the, the, you know, the root, all these different scientific disciplines, they start to come together. And, and my father and I are arguing that if you go far enough down to the, towards the roots, religion is actually going to be grafted in there as well. Um, because philosophy, religion, science, social science, all these different things, they're just different ways of humans to try to understand reality, um, to try to learn what is, to try to, to try to find out what is true. That doesn't mean they're the same because you have different tools and different rules for the different categories. That's why they branched out. There are real differences. Nobody is mm -hmm. going to confuse science with religion like out at the edges. 
but there's a fundamental just need for human beings to learn and to understand. And that is just one thing. And science is one expression of it using a certain set of tools and a certain set of questions. And religion is just another branch of that same tree. I see. No, that's great. And I was going to say, um, you know, if you study the history of science and where it came from, it's like just a historical fact that it emanated out of Christian uh, natural philosophy and natural theology is, and that's why the major universities were founded by, by Christian uh, churches. And, and it was very much them seeking to understand the nature of reality. One of the things that's interesting about that, um, cause I've, I've, I've watched and studied, you know, why, why in the West in particular in Christian nations, or maybe even in I Islamic countries, did it sort of emerge was that pure happenstance, but there, there's sort of a theory that I've heard that I find pretty compelling. And that is, we believe, like, if you go back anciently to the Greeks, the world was the arbitrary whims of the gods, right? Why did things happen? Because the god did something. And it was just the arbitrary choice of the gods. Whereas within Christianity, you have this idea of an organized universe that operates on laws rather than because there is a law giver and that God operates through law. I mean, you go, take that all the way back to Judaism and, and Islam and all of it. You know, the idea of a law like universe where there is a law giver that creates regularity in the structure of the natural world. And so unlike in a pagan context where it's just, oh, lightning struck because that's what the, you know, the, you know, Zeus decided to throw his thunderbolt. Whereas they look at it and they say, no, there are laws that govern how these things operate because they posited a law giver. And so it was their quest to understand the nature of the law giver that led them to do science because science is predicated on the presupposition that we live in an orderly universe that operates on law-like principles instead of just arbitrary chaos. And so I think it's a really astute observation that you guys are making in the book to say, look, just because we specialize this stuff out, it's us trying to understand the law-like nature of the cosmos and of being and the whole thing. Yeah, so, so the account that you're giving is like a historical one, and I think there's, there's a lot to it. Um, our approach is related, but a little bit different. It's more of a philosophical approach. Mm -hmm. And we put uh, scientism after rationalism because what, what has kind of happened is um, in hindsight, people are trying to make science totally distinct from religion because they're trying to win a social status war, right? Mm -hmm. So this isn't about what scientists are doing. This isn't about the genuine philosophy of science. This is more about a marketing campaign. And part of that marketing campaign is to take anything that looks religious and say that has nothing to do with science. And so they're trying to make science purely rationalist. It's, it's rationalism applied to science. Mm. And what we're saying is that science has never been and is not now purely rational. And we have a lot of quotes from, from different scientists and also talk a little bit about the history. The most important one there is, is um, Sir Isaac Newton, right? Um, his discovery of the laws of gravity um, and, and Newtonian physics came directly out of and was intimately tied to his work in, um, what's the word, uh, alchemy, right? And so he, he, you know, he had the Emerald Tablets and like one of the main rules in the Emerald Tablets was, which is just a, a very famous and very ancient alchemical text, was as below, as below, so above, whatever, it's, you know, that, that's the rough quote. And he took that and he was like, oh, so an apple falling from a tree below here on earth might be the same as the motion of the celestial of the you know the spheres in the celestial heavens like the moon going around the earth and so that fundamental insight that i can come up with a single law of of, of motion that's going to apply here on earth but also in the heavens that that idea of unity that's not that wasn't a rationalist idea right that didn't fit the so-called scientific method and there's not really a scientific method there's more of a scientific attitude different topic it, it wasn't like he did a bunch of experiments and then deduced that no it was an intuitive leap and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to fight back against this notion that science is a purely rationalist um, um, enterprise and religion is a purely intuitive or blind belief enterprise. And we're saying, no, absolutely not. There's a lot of reason in religion. There's 
people are logical about that as well. The premises are different, but you apply logic in religion. And in science, you apply, you apply intuition. You have to. You can't get away from it. You always have. And so that's what scientism is. Scientism is this false advertising that you can use only reason, only logic. That's the thing called science. That gets you certain knowledge. That gets you all these wonderful inventions and advances in technology. And so basically we should worship at the Church of Science. That's scientism. And, and we want to be careful to say that's not science. There's a lot of science scientists doing real science who aren't doing scientism. Um, but but yeah, that's that's kind of like it's a philosophical versus a historical distinction. Absolutely. And that's I think that's a great point. And, and I want to bring up this quote because I think it, it hits on that exact subject. You say, as in the book, you say, as social critic Terry Eagleton writes, saying that religion is unnecessary now that we have the microscope and the telescope is like saying, thanks to the electric toaster, we can forget about Chekhov, right? Who's a famous Russian playwright, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> um, in fact, he adds, if ever there was a pious myth and a piece of credulous superstition, it is the liberal rationalist belief that a few hiccups apart, we are steadily en route to a finer world, meaning because of the advances of science. What do you have to say to that, to that quote? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean... I think it's very common now to see in, in modern in contemporary commentary, this idea that um, kind of progressivism and scientism are, are almost a, a new religion. Um, you know, we've got like all this trust the science stuff, right? Trust the science, trust the science. But they were really, really sure that the lab leak hypothesis was a total conspiracy theory. <laughs> and we don't know if it's true or not yet, but it was good enough for the FBI and the Department of Energy so far. So these trust the science folks they weren't really trusting the science. That was an article of faith in a weird new religion that doesn't even know that it's actually a religion. Um, and, and so, yeah, th that's what Eagleton was saying there is like, there are some really superstitious kind of weird religious beliefs and in, in, in the, the, the people who claim to be all about science and reason. And it's like their denial of anything other than reason makes them very irrational um, and makes them susceptible to, uh, religion in, in, in its kind of worst incarnation. Absolutely. And I, I think that's the thing that is, it, it's, it's, it's limiting. They, they say that, you know, knowledge can only go this far. You can only use these methodologies. Nothing else is, is works. And then when you do that, you end up creating, you know, it, it you don't have the full picture. If you have Science without ethics, for instance, you have neo Dar or you have um, social Darwinism, and you know. There, also, there's they no just they can't do it. it. You're right that it's limiting, but it's also it's it's fundamentally incoherent, um, and and that's the that's kind of even a deeper problem. For example, all of science is founded on the basic idea of causality, which is that you get cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, prove to me causality using the scientific method. You can't. There is literally no experiment that you can do to prove causality. Causality is the assumption that you have in mind that makes experiments make sense. I'm going to do a laboratory experiment, double blind, control, blah, blah, blah. All of that only works if causality is a real principle of the universe. You can't prove that first and then use it. You just have to use it, which not to put too fine a point of it means that all science is predicated on a particular tenet of faith that the universe has certain laws and follows causality. Now, if you're a science scientismist, I want to distinguish between scientists, and you're like, oh no, we don't have any faith here. We don't do assumptions. We only do logic. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. No, like it's it's self defeating. And once people start like advancing beliefs that are self contradictory, like all bets are off with where they're going to end up because they have untethered themselves from reason, which is what they claim to to be all about. Yeah. Um, Let's let me go to another quote here from the book, moving on to kind of the subject of faith, because we talked a little bit about rationality and hard rationalism. That isn't to say, and just to clarify for everyone, we're for science. Yes. We're for reason. Unambiguously. I like electricity, running water, telescopes, computers, all of it. And I like science as a philosophy. I am 100% in favor of science. Scientism yes. is something different. Yes. And it is... It's the hyper, it, it's the exclusion of additional things 
that is the problem. It's when those things become the ultimate and nothing else is allowed into it. Now, what's interesting here in this next quote, um, let me pull it up here. This, this quote nailed me. I, I really thought it was interesting. You said, um, we have said that faith is not a proposition about reality, but a response to something emanating from that reality. Tell me what you mean by that. Um, this is this is like my father's contribution, by the way. I just want to like this is a co-written book, and that's hundred <laughs> percent him. That part right there. Um, so we define faith at the beginning of the book in as common sense and just general a way as possible, which means there's kind of two components to it. There's faithfulness, which is the idea that you have fidelity to a person or an ideal in the interest in the general sense. And also faith as belief, which is this idea that there's like, a, you know, a proposition out there that you believe, but through the course of the book, we're kind of showing that the propositional idea of faith is just insufficient. Like it, that's not really going to get you all the way to, to the mystery of why faith is important and why faith matters. Um, and what we get to in the end is, is, is this quote here, right? Which is that faith isn't just like a list of things that you believe. Faith is a response to everything going on around you in the world. Um, and, and it has to be a response because faith has to be a choice. And this is this gets really complicated. Faith has to be a choice because we know in the scriptures that people are rewarded or punished for, for, for faith, right? And if God was rewarding or punishing people for something that was outside their control, that was not a choice, that would violate justice. So faith has to be a choice. But faith can't be a choice in the sense of, I'm going to believe X, but not Y. That doesn't make sense. Nobody can just like wish themselves to believe things, right? You can't just pick and choose what you're going to believe. Belief, it arises from your assessment of the evidence, right? So how can faith be a choice? Like, what are we talking about? And this is what we're talking about. Faith is the response to the world around you as you decide what principles you're going to incorporate when you dis when you evaluate belief, what sources of evidence you're going to turn to. It kind of goes back to what you've been saying, where science is very limiting. If you're going to try to be the perfect scientist, then you're going to shut yourself off to intuition completely. Well, good luck with that. And you're going to shut yourself off to aesthetic consideration, which, by the way, we know that scientists don't do. Scientists are motivated in their theories by things like symmetry and beauty and simplicity. But if you were trying to be like the strictest scientist in the worst sense of the word, you would be cutting yourself off from all of these things that are emanating from the universe. And, and so what we're saying is that's not faith. Faith is also not just picking and choosing what to believe, but faith is your attitude in response to all the different sources of information and knowledge that are coming from the world. Beauty, truth, revelation, scripture, evidence, reason, logic. Faith is the attitude that we take when we're deciding how we want to react to all these sources of truth. And the truest source of faith, the truest faith in the sense of the word, is being open to all of the different avenues of, of, of information and knowledge. That is a choice. That is a moral choice. And we're responsible for it. We're responsible for the decision to shut our eyes or to open our eyes, to hear or not to hear. That's where the morality comes in. And it influences what we believe, but only secondarily. Because as we decide, like, what evidence am I gonna am I gonna accept? Well, downstream from that, it's gonna determine your beliefs, right? But not in like a superficial, like, childish way of like, I believe this, I don't believe that. But more, I accept um, morality into my view of what's true and what's not. I accept um, the idea that God communicate with us. So we're opening ourselves up to these avenues of information, and because of that, we're going to end up with different beliefs than we would have if we shut ourselves off to them. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I like the way you put that. So if I'm understanding correctly, the idea here is, is that you live in reality and you have a chance to respond to the reality that you exist in. And the way that you respond to that reality is a manifestation of your faith. And you, if you are not choosing to respond to the reality that is coming at you, you know, the revelation, the beauty, all of it. If you're closing your eyes to those things, you're There's not having, you've, I was given, say, up. Oh, you've go ahead. given up, but, but the word for that is pride. Like that's what we're really talking about because when you shut yourself off to those things, the reason people do that most of the time is to assert control. I'm going to decide what I'm going to pay attention to. I'm going to decide what counts as valid evidence. I'm going to be the decider. I'm in control. That's pride. And so the opposite is humility. 
I'm not going to be the decider. I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to listen. I'm going to be receptive to what's out there. And I'm going to conform my beliefs to what I learn. That's humility. And that's why there's a more there's that that's what that's why there's a moral core to faith. Because faith is an expression of humility. It's saying, I am not God. I am not the person who dictates truth and fa- truth and falsity. I am not the, the being that ultimately decides what is real and what is not real. It's a recognition that I am a finite being who is flawed, and there's a lot of stuff out there, and I don't know what's true or not, but I'm going to find out the best I can, and I'm going to subject myself to the experiences that come my way. So it really comes down to pride or humility, and that's like the core decision of faith. And that, and that openness to, to God and the different ways that he can reveal truth to you, that is a manifestation of faith in God. It's faith in the truth from wherever it comes. And at the end of the day, as I see it, you know, I don't believe in revelation is just that, you know, God only has this one way of revealing things and it just comes through like how you feel inside. I think that's part of a bigger picture of the way that truth is revealed to us. And if we want to seek God, to seek God is to seek the truth because God reveals the truth. And so to place your faith in God is to, is the act of opening up your eyes, but, but not only to open your eyes to see it, but to actually take action upon it because, and to, I guess I might put it this way. It's to join in the, like God is playing a song you need to hear it and you need to play along. You need to join in the, with your instrument to play his song. But if you don't ever, like you're saying, if you end up having a rationalist, scientistic worldview, you're going to end up not hearing the music because you're shutting off those parts of you. And in fact, the parts of you that I would say are the essence of what makes you a human being. Beauty, love, truth, all the things that we actually really care about are not the things that the scientific worldview has any explanation for or even cares about or even acknowledges. And Absolutely. so I, that's really beautiful. I like I like how you put that. Let me let me let me pull up here um this other quote. It's on this this same subject that we're talking about. At the end of the book, you say, our thesis throughout this book has been constant. Rationality and intuition find different traction at different times in differing degrees and in differing circumstances and with very uneven reliability. Neither the intellectually apprehended evidence nor the prompts to mystical awakening alone constitute faith. Faith is the integrated whole person response response the enacted decision to reconstitute one's understanding of the large picture and initiate a relationship of trust within the story that it reveals <laughs> i'm sorry i read that and i was like i was like oh that's good that is also really good. also my dad's words <laughs> well, he's good hey I, I think you it's guys both good. did a great job on this. Well, I, 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 you know, I think that's kind of uh, what I wanted to hit on in this. What are there any other things that you want to hit on before we wrap this up? Um, yeah, I would just add on a little bit to what I was last saying about humility and pride. That was kind of about faith in the most abstract um, way possible. But you're right that ultimately the faith that's going to matter is the, is the faith in Jesus Christ, and we have the same type of faith or humility versus pride thing happening there. If you believe in Jesus Christ, and if you believe that Jesus Christ knows more than you do, which you kind of have to if you believe he's Jesus the Christ, you don't know what he's going to tell you next. You don't know what he's going to reveal to you next. And that is scary. And this goes back to what we talked about with risk. And that's why faith and faithfulness, they come together in Jesus Christ. Faithfulness to our Savior means submitting ourselves to whatever the Lord does next. And we don't know ahead of time what it's going to be. And that is scary and it will entail sacrifice. And that's why it's faith. And that's why faith and humility are are intimately tied together. 
when we think that we know all the answers ahead of time, there's no room for God to tell us anything. And we make ourselves a nice little cocoon, a nice little safe space where nothing can intrude because we already know all the answers. It's pride. Pride is protective. But when we hitch our, our wagon to uh, the Lord and we say, wherever you're going to go, I'm going to follow. We don't know what's going to happen next. We're giving up control and we're opening ourselves to be taught, to be tried, to be refined um, by our Savior. And it is fundamentally, uh, it just shows that, that connection between humility and faith. And I just wanted to close with that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for, for coming on. It's been great. Um, everybody, go out, get the book. Where can they Where can they find the book? What's the easiest way for them to find it? It's on Amazon and it's on Audible. Um, I think it's also Deseret Book. Um, so any of those places. Perfect. I will drop the link into the video description for everyone to, to get the book. Get it, read it, share it with your friends. Um, and uh, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for, for putting together this, this great book for us to read. Thank you so much for having me, Jacob. It was great. Not a problem. Take care. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.